just gonna go ahead and say it. This, the Sony a7S III is incredible. I haven't had this much fun filming with a camera in so long. And if you haven't seen my last video where I just show all sorts of footage from all sorts of conditions with this camera. Go and watch that. It includes surprising Daniel Schiffer with the Sony a7S III and letting him test it out. It's the Sony a7S III. You're joking. Nope. <laughs> I don't understand. Is this, this is why I'm here. This is why I invited you. <laughs> you wanna? <laughs> and learning how to wake surf with Chris Howe, which was incredible, and he tested this camera out too. Uh, so go and watch that footage first because it'll give you an idea of what this camera can really do, and then watch this review for all the insights and my opinions on the new Sony a7S III. Also, this has never happened to me before. That video was trending. That's crazy, I, I don't, thank you, I don't know what to say crazy that is trending. Okay, honestly, I don't know where to start because there's just so much goodness, but it basically seems like Sony listened to the people and fixed all the little gripes that we had with Sony's and just made this perfect camera. Could it, I, don't, I don't even know, can I say that? I don't even know if that's possible, but let's start off with the best stuff. Full frame 4K up to 120 frames per second. And I gotta say, it looks incredible. Like it looks so good, it's so clean. It might be some of the best 120 frames per second that I've seen in like any camera. There is a tiny crop in 120 frames per second in 4K, but it's so small that you probably won't even notice it. And in general, the 4K just looks so good to me. They have some new codecs too. They got the H.265 for better compression, still high quality, and then they still have the H.264 at a really high bit rate. And we got All Eye, which is a little bit easier to edit with, really great. But there is no 6K or 8K, there's only 4K. And you might be a little bit surprised, especially since there were so many rumors saying that this would be a 6K camera. But Sony has decided to take a, a little bit of a different approach with this camera. They decided to go with a 12 megapixel sensor. And before you start writing, pass, my smartphone's better than that, don't be dumb. This is to maximize the video capabilities. And for me, the Sony a7S III is a video first camera. Unlike most of the mirrorless and DSLR cameras, which are photo first cameras that can also do some really great videos, the Sony a7S III is a video first camera. Just look at the megapixels for the best cameras out there. The megapixel counts aren't that high, except for maybe the reds, but specifically look at the Aries, they're the highest caliber, the best cameras that you could get. They're the most widely used in Hollywood and the megapixels are pretty low. Now I'm not some super tech engineer guy. If you want some of that, definitely go and check out Gerald Undone's review. But basically having a smaller megapixel count allows for each pixel to be bigger and therefore in theory better. For example, the Canon R5 and the Sony a7S III have the same physical size of sensor, but the Canon R5 has 45 megapixels, whereas the Sony a7S III only has 12 megapixels. That means each pixel is a lot bigger and that allows for a cleaner image, less noise, maybe even more dynamic range. I, I don't know exactly all of the engineering theory behind it, but it allows for a better image. And the benefit is that it doesn't have to process through 45 megapixels worth of data. It only has to do 12 megapixels. So that's a lot easier on the processor and allows for a much faster readout. So that means things like rolling shutter are gonna be much less apparent like we saw in Gerald Undone's video. But I also assume that's gonna cause less heat less overheating. But more importantly, that allows for that crazy clean image and crazy low light sensitivity, which we'll talk about a little bit later. 4K 120 frames per second is incredible. 120 frames per second is back better than ever. It is really, really nice. And then, 240 frames per second in full HD. And usually when I hear about a spec like this, I'm kind of like, mm, I'm probably not gonna use it. It probably doesn't look very good. 
but this looks really good to me. No, it's not as good as the 120 frames per second in 4K, but it's still really good and usable in my opinion. You can see it breaking up a little bit in the water, but honestly, I don't think most people would ever notice that. I absolutely loved using it with the wake surfing, just some of the coolest shots I was able to get that just wouldn't be possible even with 120 frames per second. So I'm definitely gonna be using 240 frames per second in full HD. And way more important for me than resolution, like 12K Blackmagic, we, I don't think we need 12K yet, is dynamic range. Ask any legit good filmmaker, they would way rather have dynamic range than crazy resolution. And again, the a7S III has dynamic range, up to 15 stops, Sony is claiming, but uh, these standards are a little bit all over the place, so you can't really trust them. But again, Gerald Dundon did a good test and it looks like about 13 stops of usable dynamic range, which is incredible. That's like cinema camera territory. By the way, thanks again, Gerald, for doing all these tests that I would never have the patience for, but I love watching and hearing because it allows for me to really see what the best way to use a camera is. So thank you, Gerald. If you haven't watched it, again, go and watch Gerald's video. And this dynamic range is way more important to me than the 240 frames per second or having 6K or 8K. Having this much dynamic range really gives it this film-like look or cinematic look, whatever you wanna call it. It's really impressive. And here's a couple comparisons between S-Log2 and S-Log3, which is where you're gonna get the most dynamic range. Okay, so this is S-Log2 straight at a camera and then let's color correct it and see what that looks like. Is it looking good? I'm curious what happens to these. Are these completely blown out or, or is, is there detail there still? Uh, I guess same with this 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 little light here. And now this is S-Log3, uh, straight out camera. Let's go ahead and color correct that and now you can see a bit of a difference. Um, at this point, I don't know which is harder, which is easier to color correct. I've usually preferred S-Log2. I think it's just a little bit easier, but now at 10-bit, S-Log3 might be great. Uh, and both of these are with the new S-Cine Tone Color Science, which I think is way better than I've seen anything out of a Sony before. Other than the FX9, the FX9 looks really, really great. And, and obviously the Venice, you, you probably don't even know what the Venice, the Venice is, they're a very expensive camera. In the past, you would rarely, if ever, hear somebody say, Sony has the best color science. Usually people would say that about Canon cameras, but now we have the S Cinetone color science, which is the color science from their Venice cinema cameras, which is like their flagship cinema camera. It costs like over $40,000, crazy beast camera. And you're getting that color science inside of the Sony a7S III. And this is gonna be a big statement for me. This is the first time that I think Sony's color science is better than Canon's color science. <laughs> that, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow coming from a mostly Canon user for the past couple of years, but the colors look really nice. It has this really cinematic quality to it while still keeping very natural skin tone colors, which is probably the most important thing when it comes to color science. And this makes it so much easier to color grade the Sony footage than, than I've ever experienced, especially using the S-Logs, which, which are kind of notoriously known to be a little bit hard to color grade. Even with just contrast and saturation added, it has this really nice cinematic quality to it, and this might be one of the biggest selling features for me with the Sony a7S III. Probably one of the most expected things is the crazy low light capabilities. The Sony a7S II was already insane in low light, and now they're claiming that the Sony a7S III is about twice as good in low light as the a7S II, which is, insane. Now the ISO still goes to the same amount, 409,600 I believe, but they're claiming that it's about twice as clean because of the new sensor technology and how they, all that engineering stuff. Yes, I was filming 120 frames per second in pitch black conditions, lighting Daniel Schiffer with only his smartphone screen just being on, not even like the, the LED light, just the screen being on, 
and it looked really great. And interestingly, Gerald Anun found that it almost looks like there's like a dual native ISO. So the native ISO I believe is 640, but then once you get to 16,000 ISO, it gets cleaner again. So 16,000 ISO is cleaner than 12,800, which doesn't really make sense unless there was some sort of dual native ISO. Now, I haven't heard anything about that. Nobody said anything about that, but that's really interesting to know. I only had this camera for a few days, so I didn't get to do a ton of tests but it's safe to say that this is the best low light camera there ever was, I think. Now let's talk about the body. The best thing is the full flip out screen. I don't know why they haven't done this. It is incredible. It is not just for vloggers. It is not just for videographers. It is for everybody. It is so handy having a flip LCD screen. And I remember Daniel Schiffer saying like, oh, I, I didn't really feel like I needed a flip LCD screen because he doesn't really do like the vlogging thing too often. But then we were filming that little B-roll montage, Daniel Schiffer style, and he was doing that overhead shot of the box and now you can just flip the LCD screen and see exactly what you're filming. Instead of what he had before, he would be kind of limited to that, but now he can go full top down. You can see exactly what you're filming. There's just so many uses for a flip LCD screen. It is the greatest thing on a camera. Every camera should have one. And no, it doesn't catch on the microphone jack, which is really great. And now we got full size HDMI, which is a lot more stable, sturdy. It's not gonna just snap off. And did I mention you can get 16 bit raw up to 120 frames per second in 4K from that HDMI externally. That's pretty crazy. The new record button is awesome. It's much better than before. And I love that you can both charge and do data transfers through the USB-C. So in theory, you don't even need a memory card reader, or if you forget your memory card reader, you can just get your footage using a USB-C cable, which most of us have a whole bunch of them lying around. And we got dual card slots for all of you weirdos who want it so bad. You got it, dual card slots. And it's interesting, both of the slots can take both CF Express A, which is like a really small CF Express card and SD cards. And it's really nice. You can film almost everything onto a really fast SD card, except for, let me check my notes, the XAVC SI format in SNQ mode at 120 frames per second. I think that's the only one that you can't record onto SD cards. And speaking of the body, this might be the secret sauce for every vlogger, YouTuber out there. This is the, let me check my notes again, the ECM B1M electronic microphone, and it is tiny, but still really, really high quality. Let me give you a size comparison. This is my EOS R Canon setup. This is my Canon setup with the Rode VideoMic Pro on here. Look at the size difference. Not only the body, the lens is a little bit smaller on the Sony, and then this microphone is absolutely ridiculous, and it's still really high quality. It's not like you're, you're sacrificing quality. It's an electronic microphone, no cords. It goes straight into the hot shoe. The shock mount is built in, so you don't have any extra stuff. It's just this super sleek little microphone. And now going back to my Canon setup here, uh, this just looks ridiculous in comparison. And actually, this might be the best high-end vlogger setup that money can buy right now. It is not cheap at all. This microphone is pretty expensive actually, but this is the best vlogging setup you could have right now, in my opinion. If Casey Neistat had this in his, his vlogger era days, he would have tossed every single other camera out the window, I'm pretty sure. Now, granted, he probably would have glued every single setting on this microphone to make sure that he doesn't knock anything off. But this right here is a vlogger's dream camera setup. The quality, all of the, the specs, all of that, but also the size and flip LCD screen. This combo right here is the cliche game changer and might be one of the biggest factors for me in choosing what camera system I go with in the future. Also, if you need even more audio recording options, they have the Sony XLR K3M dual channel digital XLR audio adapter, which Potato Jet says he uses all the time on his Sony. 
Uh, so you can essentially make the Sony a7 III into this like tiny beast cinema documentary camera. It's pretty crazy, especially with the no record limits, uh, except for in 120 frames per second, I think it's capped at an hour, which is an absurdly long time to film 120 frames per second, but there's no record limits. And better yet, there is no overheating. Uh, I have used this camera quite a bit, shot for long periods of time, Schiffer tried it. We were filming 120 frames per second in 4K for a couple hours straight, and we didn't have any overheating at all. And that's a big deal, not even just comparing it to the R5, but for Sony, uh, all of the past Sony cameras that I've ever used have had some sort of overheating issue until now. New menus, another gripe of mine that has been fixed. Sony menus are notoriously just not very good. Now they're a lot better, really enjoy that. You got a great EVF if you're into that sort of thing. I don't really use it that much, so it doesn't really matter to me, but you got it. Autofocus is crazy fast, crazy good. I don't really know where it stacks up now in comparison to Canon, but it is very impressive and I don't think you will have really any issues with autofocus, except for maybe situations where there isn't really much contrast or, or like definition in whatever you're trying to autofocus on. I think that's when maybe Canon does a little bit better, but man, the autofocus is really, really good. Battery life is decent, so much better than Sony's used to be back in the day, so nothing to complain about there. If I had to complain, if I had to nitpick, there's probably only three things that are, are, are kind of downsides. The first one being IBIS stabilization. There's nothing really that great about it. It, it works, it's fine, but it's not that impressive, it's not that great but that also means you're not gonna get any crazy wobbles like you might get with the GH5 or the Olympus cameras or the new R5. You might get a little bit of that wobble because it's a lot stronger. The IBIS, the stabilization is nothing to go crazy over on the Sony a7S III. Editing this footage is just ch 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 It's really bad in both Premiere and Final Cut Pro. It is very hard on these programs. Um, I had to use proxies on my 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is what I edited uh, that last video on. It just, it would have taken me forever and there was like barely any playback available. It is very, very taxing on your computer, especially depending on which codec you're using. And then lastly, photography. It's fine, I'm sure for most people, it's fine, it's not that big of a deal, but this is not a photography first camera. To me, this is definitely a video first camera that can do some photography. It's definitely not gonna be as good as something like the R5, and I don't think anybody is gonna argue that. So that could be a downside for you. But I think for a lot of people, the photos are still gonna be fine, even at 12 megapixels. So the final verdict of the Sony a7S III it might be a perfect, it might be the closest thing that we've ever gotten to a perfect camera. And I always say there is no perfect camera, but this is very, very close. So who is the Sony a7S III for, in my opinion? Well, I think it's like super versatile. One of the most versatile cameras. I could see it being really great for, for the lower budget productions, for wedding shooters, for corporate videos. It would be great for music videos. You have so many options with all the different frame rates and clean image and all of that stuff. Documentaries, no record limits, amazing image, great audio options. I could definitely shoot some little documentaries on this or at least use it as a great, really great, probably the best B camera ever. The image is so nice that I could even see a lot of people shooting short films and that kind of stuff on it. The color science is really great on it. The image is so clean. And like I said, this is probably the best camera ever made at the highest quality level possible for YouTuber vlogger type people. And the cost is $3,500. And while that sounds pretty reasonable to me with all of the stuff that you're getting, it's still a lot of money. So I would say, even though this camera looks incredible, don't jump the gun. Make sure to watch as many reviews as you can possible. 
test it out again if possible, even though I, I know that sucks having to wait till September and until they come out and then getting your hands on on. You might not get it till October in your hands. It sucks waiting, but it's still a lot of money, especially if you're switching from other camera companies because you're gonna have to buy Sony glass and that is not cheap at all. It is very, very expensive. So take your time. There's no rush. Be smart, don't impulse buy. Would I recommend the Sony a7S III? Yes, 1000%. I pre-ordered it. I'm really curious to use it more and see how it fits in my workflow and whether or not I might even switch camera systems, which is a big deal for me because I've invested a lot into the Canon cameras. So we'll see, but well done, Sony. Well done, very impressed. You guys are making amazing products. And as a filmmaker, I am very, very, thankful. I'm legit so sad that I have to pack this camera up now and give it back to Sony. I, I don't even know how, I just want to keep using it to see if this could be like my perfect camera or not and do some tests against the R5, some more of that. Uh, but man, I got to give this back and it's going to be me waiting around just like you guys till September uh, to use this. But thanks Sony for letting me test this out. I very much appreciate it. <laughs> I just want to keep it though. Is there any way I can keep it? Are you guys sure? Anyway, please?